Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm uh, adding yet another accent to the presentation, so I hope you uh, can follow. So my name is Alexander Damisch. I'm with Wind River. By the way, who knows Wind River? A few hands going up. So for those of you who know us, I'd like to reset the image a little bit, tell you how we changed over the years. I give a very short introduction there. For those of you who don't know us, I'd like to give a short introduction who we are. Uh, the other objective, and uh, the speaker from Meridium kind of took away my question uh, already, was, uh, you know, who of you is an end customer and who of you actually the provider into the market? Uh, so the objective here really is not to do a product presentation explaining how great we all are. Uh, it's a little bit more telling the story we're discussing with our customers since years. And I tell you who our customers are on a high level a little bit later and what kind of storyline resonates, hoping to get a stronger mind share with the people here because the group in this room actually, that's the ecosystem, talking to each other this moment, but selling into this market. And unless we bring up a very consistent story, uh, there is a risk of the market to be confused and it's more difficult for all of us to provide a joint solution. So with that, I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction who we are. Wind River's been in the market for more than 30 years. Um, we've been acquired a few years ago uh, by a company you know pretty well, Intel. We're now a wholly owned but fully independent subsidiary there. We are part of the IoT Solutions Group um, and keep gaining market share within that context. Uh, from a market point of view, with about 45% commercial market share, we are by far the biggest player there, market leader here, um, in every segment. And when we talk about segments, we're serving the embedded market, telco, industrial controls, robots, transportation, healthcare, aerospace, defense. So if you did fly in yesterday by plane, very likely you had a system on board powered by our system. If you got in by London uh, Underground today or by train, likely powered by a system. Uh, if you pick up the phone, do a phone call, they're likely in the base station or in the uh, back end somewhere there's a system running our software. So that's kind of the system space where we are in. You don't see us. And usually you're glad if you don't find out that there is something in the background because if you find out something has failed. So that's you know, really something that's very critical infrastructure. Uh, from a scale point of view, we have um, about 1.5 billion embedded devices out there. That's the official number we can uh, claim without getting into trouble with our competition, uh, powered by our technology. And you think about embedded spaces, this is not cell phones. This is embedded systems, control systems, and so on. This is a pretty impressive number. And that's kind of creating the link why we're talking here about IoT or M2M. All these devices present an opportunity or a challenge when we talk about IoT or M2M. And from a um, annual R&D spend, uh, 90 million, I think also in that space, a pretty impressive number here. So let's have a look a little bit about IoT and how intelligent uh, devices can power that space. Uh, by the way, you hear me talking about IoT all the time, not about M2M. Uh, basically, if you look off what we try to uh, achieve with that, it's the same thing. The reason why we use IoT is that if you talk about M2M to a customer, and we're talking to all the uh, tier one OEMs in this market, M2M, uh, our friends from the um, operators did a really good job, is usually associated with a box that has a SIM card in there. So if you want to talk about really an end-to-end -end solution, it helps if we you now talk about IoT here, because people have a more open mind there. So when you talk about IoT, uh, IoT and the main challenge there, it's really about the convergence, about the IT space. And you know, we had people from Oracle here and we have SAP in here talking about you know, the big data, databases, business logic. And then we have all the deeply embedded space. You know, the people who build devices that are out there for the next 15, 20, maybe in 30 years, who have a completely different way of thinking. So the idea here really is how can we converge the IT and the OT space so we get the data up there and can do something useful. 
So what's really the value behind IoT? Why do we do that? What's, what, what does IoT really mean? Well, the key thing here when we talk to customers, number one is, is cost reduction. And the key challenge most of our customers actually have is that their devices are under high cost pressure. You know, devices out there in embedded space, they used to be rocket science 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Today, they all really compete on price and have an issue there. There is this topic out about the power of 1%. What if we could solve the problem and reduce your, I don't know, full costs of an airline by 1%? How big would the saving be? That's a huge value, and that has to do with the operational costs. And we see that uh, really it's a conversation that goes from a bill of material conversation to an OPEX conversation. How can I argue on the next 10 years are going to save you that much money? The number two here is the new revenue capture uh, conversation. Many of our customers do have a lot of deployed devices out there. Think about a robotics company selling into the automotive production space, like KUKA Robotics. Great technology, but there is a kind of a, you know, upper level of how many robots you can sell to the industry. And then you have a downturn in uh, 2007 where many of the car manufacturers actually went south or have big issues. So how do you sell more robots on the market? So how can I get new revenue out of existing deployed devices? That's a key uh, theme here. And that's much more disruptive than many people think. If you think about somebody who used to sell devices or machines, and you want to change that to a new theme, that has a huge impact on the business process and is highly disruptive for these people. And then the last one, uh, which I actually believe is a key one, it's a topic about faster innovation. So what does faster innovation actually mean? If you think about uh, BlackBerry, Nokia, I hope nobody from these companies over here and uh, complain about using that example. They woke up one day after being the market leader in, a, in the market space and found out that somebody else actually took the market by being much more innovative. And that's the main fear of the market out there. What can I do to be still on the edge to keep my you know, differentiation up? And if you think about selling IoT solutions on the market, you have two metrics there where people officially will argue to take action on because you can calculate it. Cost and new revenue is something where you can do an Excel sheet, do a net present value calculation, and explain why you need to do that. In reality, what they do is they take that to argue something where, in reality, they think about the innovation thing, the piece that really keeps them awake at night. So that's the key thing. And the conclusion out of that really is IoT is not a technology. It's a business case. So whenever we talk to a customer and tell them, look, I do have a box here, plug it in, and you're uh, in the IoT space, these conversations usually do not go well because the conversation has to start on what do, can I do here up on the business case level for you. That's the key element for these guys out there. With that, I'd like to talk about uh, two main use cases. The first one is uh, taking a very typical old-style example of assets you sell. That's a forklifter. And usually, these devices used to be sold. Maybe you have a services contract. And then you really hope that you know, they're going to need another one in five years or 10 years from now. The challenge there is that a forklifter today is not really rocket science anymore. And people, they look at their costs, the users. And they want to make sure that they utilize them as well as possible. So what's happening is that people move away from buying something into actually paying for the usage of something. So it's an operating leasing uh, concept there. So suddenly, they lease a capacity. So it makes a lot of sense for the provider, for the uh, forklift uh, um, producer to create a model where they know exactly how much they used how many of the big ones, heavy lifters you need, how many of the small ones, uh, what's the wear on the machines, how many of them get into the deep freeze area where you have uh, different maintenance requirements. So they're completely changing over the 
whole business model to a uh, leasing model where suddenly the assets are not sold anymore and switching from a CAPEX to a really OPEX model. Just to take another example that came up in the news recently, uh, I think everybody has heard about the sad news um, about Malaysian Airlines, the airplane they lost somewhere, and then suddenly a week after they found out that they actually knew in which area it was because the jet engines from Rolls Royce, they were still phoning home, I think they even used the Radium network, and telling them, look, I'm still there and I'm still operating, and by that they found out that the plane uh, turned around and moved in a different direction. So that's another example of that. Rolls-Royce is not selling really their engines anymore. They are leasing the uh, usage of the jet engine. So more hours you produce, you know, the more they charge you for that. A complete revolution in the, uh, different way of selling products. And that's exactly IoT because in order to do that, you require the data for your decisions to calculate the maintenance, to find out whether it's used or abused, to find out which engine or which forklifter would be the right one for you. So all these data is now required to make intelligent decisions. The uh, second use case here, I think it's, some, it's one you already have seen, or many of you, it's about wind turbines. You know, wind turbines, sometimes they're offshore, sometimes they're not offshore, but whenever you think about wind turbines, they're pretty expensive, and if they break, it's a huge maintenance issue. So the key use case number one for wind turbines is you need to keep them operating. It's very expensive if you shut them down. If you have to fly out offshore with a helicopter, uh, I think one flight is about 400K US dollar. So preventive maintenance or predictive maintenance is a key requirement. So they're collecting all the data about sensor dust, vibration information, and taking this data from one wind turbine is of limited use. But if you now think about the patterns of one million wind turbines, and you combine them and do an analytics about it and find out that actually there's a pattern that leads to a shutdown of the gearbox or whatever, you can then predict maintenance, and you can do two things. You can go there before it breaks, which is really helpful, and plan it. And the other thing is you can actually degrade the operation, change the blade pitch a little bit, and make sure it's not breaking. It's producing maybe 30% less energy, but you're not breaking it. So that's the key use case number one. And then there is a second one, which is really interesting. If you think about wind turbines, in many cases, they are like a wind park, one after the other. And if you optimize the first wind turbine in the whole row, Usually it's running perfect, but it's creating a turbulence in the background, and the turbulence is impacting the second wind turbine, and the third, and the fourth. So suddenly, you know, you tuned everything, and then you degrade the whole operation because the next wind turbine is not running at perfect settings. So with that information, with adaptive analytics, you can take that information and adjust the blade pitch again a little bit and make sure that every wind turbine is running at perfect um, optimized settings there. Two use cases that make a lot of sense and uh, bring new business value to the customers and also reduce the cost. With that, I'd like to look at one architecture for IoT. Well, we know everybody has an architecture chart. And by the way, there's no architecture chart which is 100% true and the right one. So think of it about a, at a meta model. So how the whole environment looks like. And I use it usually to explain the different words where people are coming from. If we start down there at the device world, let's call it the on equipment, think about the airplane, think about the robotic control system, uh, think about the secondary substation in the energy space. Uh, this is usually the on equipment space where you have critical real-time devices. And critical means that if you go on a train, and if it crashes, you probably die. So it's really critical infrastructure. And the idea is really getting these devices into the IoT, which is a huge challenge. Another challenge in this area is these devices, they, we already discussed, are under intense cost pressure. And people are extremely reluctant to change them. And if we now take another metric of that space, look at the 
energy market in North America, about 70% of the energy infrastructure in North America is older than 30 years. So let's think about IoT or M2M in that space, or they call it smart grid. Let's go there, you know, make everything greenfield, change everything. It's not happening. So you have to get the existing install base, that's what we call brownfield, into the IoT. And this leads to an interesting effect that actually the innovation and the value and the business applications, they're not being implemented down there in that area. They are implemented on the IT space. So that's where people are more flexible to add new functions there. And eventually we have the topic about big data and public cloud here. And that's another interesting topic. Whenever I talk to um, tier ones in the uh, industrial OEM market and you talk about big data, you're usually a little bit in trouble because they say, ah, big data is not happening. I'm not giving you my data. Way too dangerous. So that's something we need to explain them, how you get into big data, what's the value. And by the way, big data is not a risk if you do it properly. It's a huge value. Let's have a look at that. Uh, by the way, uh, the space in between, that's something we call the fog, because it's not really cloud yet, but it's all not a device space here. Let's have a look at the whole architecture from a different point of view. So let's think again. We have these devices down there, and we have the big data or the cloud space up there. How do we connect it? And we're talking here about the secure parameter gateway. Uh, everybody who has to do with the energy space, and it's in North America, may have heard about secure parameter. That's a term borrowed from the NERC SIP standard. The NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corp. And the standard they brought up is the Critical Infrastructure Protection Standard, which says if you connect something, you're going to make sure that it's still enforced and all the connectivity is either encrypted or whatever. Really very uh, careful environment where people want to make sure that you don't break something. And the Secure Parameter Gateway is a concept that you take a gateway, you retrofit it, and I've seen a lot of gateways there, so everybody knows what it is, and make sure that you cannot hack in from the outside into an infrastructure and do something weird. One example of that, uh, you know, what happens if you break into a control system is Stuxnet, where they managed to uh, blow up um, a control system with a pretty bad impact. And the reason for that is, if you're able to hack into a system, you could shut down or derail trains. You could shut down the whole, elect uh, the whole electrical grid of a whole nation. You can really attack the whole system. That's the reason why it's really key. At the next level down there, we do have some kind of data aggregation. So if you think about a complex installation like an energy grid, you're not going to add one gateway and that's all. You have different levels of data aggregation there, certain intelligence, different standards. Uh, you may have very legacy standards, like you know, a um, wireless hard system, stuff like that. You need to integrate there. And then, obviously, you always have new systems where people say, well, I'm doing a redesign. So from the very beginning, I design in everything I need for IoT. Another thing you find in here is the trusted systems. Everybody knows what trusted systems are? So trusted systems are the ones that are really critical. And we talk here about functional safety. Functional safety means that you're talking about the device. If it fails, it could kill people's life. It could be a train control system, interlocking system. It could be on an airplane or system. So these systems are really key in here. We should not ne neglect them because they are the reason why people usually do not go into M2M or IoT because these systems, you know, if you connect them and if you break into them, you can break safety and you can do very dangerous things. So we have to take care of them. So now we have gateway and we have all the data on that on-premises field here. So what are we going to do at the next step? You know, I brought up the topic of big data with big customers and they're all very scared. Just think about, let's take Audi. Audi had a huge plant in Ingolstadt, 
And if you go in there, if you invite it in there, it's a very secure environment, you see about 500 robots moving. A perfect space to collect data and do preventive maintenance on robots. The idea to take data and send it up into the internet is a complete no-go for these gentlemen. Absolutely no-go. First, the process for manufacturing is their secret source. And they're really scared of anybody you know, doing something weird with it or breaking it. That's the reason why we have this concept of an on-premises cloud, where at first step, people keep information on-premises and collect it there. They can do their first level of optimization there. And key element, they can make sure if they decide to share information with, uh, for example, KUKA, who does the robots, by the way, using our operating system. So if they want to share information, they want to collect it, have visibility, and make sure that no critical information is shared up there into the cloud, which can be malicious. And then at the next level, you can offer really the idea of the you know, kind of embedded cloud up there where you uh, collect the data and do something key about that. So when we talk about cloud in the context of IoT and the context of critical infrastructure, there's a key element that comes into play. People, when they think about cloud, they think about probably Amazon Web Services. If they think about industrial, they talk about critical. So that's the reason where if you have a cloud up there, you want to make sure that it's absolutely uh, secure, reliable, not shutting down. That's where the Kara Great platform comes in, a 5.9 availability platform, high performance and high secure. So talking about these different levels here, the uh, gateway and data aggregation level is something uh, where we call it the intelligent device platform, which is exactly what the gateway platforms are doing here. Connectivity and manageability, we don't need to discuss. You all know what it is. Security is not a key element, which I believe today is neglected. And then edge intelligence or analytics is a key element, which people require there, because you cannot send up gigabytes or terabytes of data. You have to do local aggregation and then send up the information which is required. Trusted systems is about safety security. Edge management is about device management. It's about data aggregation. And it's a layer for the business logic up there. And when we talk about Keragrade, that's a platform that allows you to provide services that are absolutely you know, secure, reliable, and available. So let's do a fast forward here a little bit. I know that I'm running out of time. Switch over there. When we talk about uh, the gateway platform, that's how the stack here looks today. It's basically, if you look at it, you've heard about Java these days. You have heard about MQTT uh, yesterday. Uh, now we have you know, all these open technologies here integrated in one platform and made sure that it's uh, kept secure. And when we talk about security, it's worth to spend just one more minute on that. Security is really a key element. So if you, if you look at your smartphone today, either you have an Android phone or probably an iPhone, you know these can be jailbroken or rooted, which means you can run a patched version of the original software, which means you can bypass the Apple Store or the Play Store, and you can do anything with this device. That's exactly what you need to prevent if you talk about a gateway. That's the reason why we make sure if this device is starting up, you only run the original design software on it. If it's running, we find out if somebody hacked into it. And if you're communicating, we make sure that the data is not being taken away, altered, changed, or whatever. Really, really key elements. If you can't provide that, that will uh, potentially lock you out of many, many different markets. Really key takeaways are IoT, the business case. It's not a technology. It means new revenue for the customer. And that's the conversation we should have at the beginning. We see the biggest opportunity today in the brownfield area, so retrofitting intelligence into the critical infrastructure out there where they see huge value, business like you know, energy, control, process, 
all these spaces are a huge opportunity here. And the core challenges here are really security because it's impacting safety. It's connectivity, and when I talk about connectivity, we have latency requirements that need to be fulfilled, and then manageability, where it's absolutely mandatory that we support standards because IoT is about sharing. It's a, you know, a big ecosystem play. Proprietary solutions will not have a big chance there. So with that, I'd like to thank you and hope that it was a few Thank you very much. <laughs>